It's time for the The Douglas Douglas Coleman Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From From the the entertainment entertainment industry industry, to to authors authors, to to political political and social social commentators. commentators, The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Well, hello there. Heidi, howdy, ho there. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, as always, Douglas Coleman. How are you? We've got Tim Ward here today. Tim is the co-owner of Intermedia Communications Training, Inc., based in Washington, D.C., and he's also now a partner with Dr. Gleb Sapersky, who was on our show about three years ago um, when he was introducing his Pro-Truth Pledge book and movement. We have been running their ad since then because it's something I feel strongly about. I think the pro-truth movement is a great step in the right direction of holding politicians, regardless of your political affiliations, but holding politicians accountable to the truth. Tim will talk about the new book called Pro-Truth and what we can do as American citizens to put truth back into politics. For more information on the pro-truth movement, you can go to ProTruthPledge.org. And we will be right back with Tim Ward. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there, this is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James. Uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through the Rocket Records. And uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T A L K. 21 in figures.com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians and everyone else to commit to truth oriented behaviors. The pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at protruthpledge.org. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? 
JoinMusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hi, this is John Morgan, production supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Tim Ward. Hi, Tim, how are you? Good, thank you, Douglas. Pleasure to be here with you and your listeners. Well, thank you for coming on the show. You were, or or you are, uh, partnered now with uh, Dr. Gleb, and I I still can't pronounce his last name. Is it Sapersky? Sapersky, that's right. Okay. He was on our show, uh, we looked it up, it was uh, three years ago, and he had a book out called The Pro-Truth Pledge, and it was, well, more than a book, it was actually a whole movement that we talked about. So how long have you been uh, partnered up with him? About um, two and a half years now, and indeed The Pro-Truth Pledge is how I first met Gleb. I wanted to write a book as a pushback to the post-truth movement, and as soon as I started doing research, I found found Gleb, of course, because his stand is so such a strong one. And we decided that we would collaborate together on the book Pro-Truth, uh, subtitled A Practical Plan for Putting Truth Back into Politics, as our, our way of really helping um, reach ordinary Americans to take a stand for the importance of truth in our political system. Okay, well, you just opened up a huge Pandora's box, which we probably <laughs> we probably are not going to be able to even cut the surface in 20 minutes. But uh, we'll see what we can do here. Okay, so it's a new book, right? The book is called what? Say mm-hmm. it again, please. Pro-Truth, and the subtitle, A Practical Plan for Putting Truth Back into Politics. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the definition of truth, first of all, Mm -hmm. because I'm of the opinion that something like mathematics and science is pretty easy for people to agree on what is true and what is not. I think most people would agree one plus one equals two. And Mm. when you're talking about politics, You've got subjective, you've got objective, but there's even to the point where a particular issue can be debated to whether it even exists or not. And if you don't even have a starting point of that, it's pretty difficult to get people to agree. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. You need a starting point. And uh, you know, Douglas, I'm not I actually studied philosophy in, uh, in in university, and I was a real truth junkie back then. And one of the things that four years of study brought me out believing is that it's hard to know truth in any absolute sense. A capital T truth is forever elusive. But at the same time, it's pretty easy to have a pragmatic definition of truth as, you know, that which can be observed as happening in space or time. Now, it's going to leave you with some wiggle room. What does somebody intend? Does somebody promises? Are they sincere? Yeah, those things, it's hard to tell. But, you know, if I say I ate breakfast yesterday at the Tasty Diner, the local dive across the street from where I live, if, if somebody went there, they could see, you know, was I there or was I not there? It's either true or false. Um, let's take something as concrete as a coronavirus test. If somebody did a test, that test either came back positive or negative. It may not be definitive on whether or not they had the disease, but a test gave a result. So there's lots of things that we can simply say, yes, that's what the test said. Yes, this is what the Labor Department produced as their statistics. So unless we can at least agree on some common fact, how do you ever create policy? How do you have a reasonable debate? So the problem with pro-truth politics is facts no longer matter. Politicians say whatever they want just to get people to believe them. And that is very dangerous. That's what leads to the end of democracy. You know, I first encountered that as a young man when I, I traveled in, um, post, in the, uh, the, the still communist countries of Eastern Europe. And uh, when I was in China, I saw firsthand that totalitarian countries not only disregard the truth, but it's outlawed to speak the truth. 
if it's against what the regime says. Yeah. And that's made a deep impression on me, which is why I think it's so important that we value truth in our political system. Well, I'm happy to hear that you have traveled and spent time outside of the United States, because I think one of the biggest problems with most Americans, and I saw a statistic that says 95% of Americans have never left the United States. Now, that, that's a pretty yeah. amazing statistic. So if you think about it, 95%, so only 5% of us have ever left the country. And I don't think they were counting like going to Canada. I don't think they meant that. Right. I think yeah. they meant, you know, really out of the country. So people in this country, because the country is so big and we're so vast, that have a very skewed view of the world. And I've spent time mm -hmm. outside of the United States, and I have seen similar things probably to what you see. I never, I didn't ever went to Russia, uh, but I have been to Laos, and I've been to Cambodia, and I've been to Thailand, and, you know, technically Laos is still a communist country, Techn technically Cambodia is, although I'm not sure what communism means in those countries anymore other than just the flag, mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, it, it looks like a, a normal life for people. Um, anyways, my point being is that when people see the world from the outside, when people see the United States from the outside looking in, it looks very different than people who are looking at it from the inside looking out. That's really my That's point. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so... And I, I guess this is going to all dive into politics because this is primarily what your focus is on, correct? Is yes. getting the truth. Okay. So let's take something just as an example that people are going to argue about whether or not it even exists. And I'll just pick something. Let's, let's use institutional racism, okay? Because I've heard the argument... Mm -hmm on that one from both sides. A lot of people believe that it just simply does not exist, that it is just a made-up concept. I would argue that it definitely existed up until 1964, because you could prove it existed. They had separate facilities mm -hmm. for people based on their, on their race. Okay, once that it was eliminated, it's a little more vague now. And... I would ask people, well, can you give me an example at this point, you know, of what you would think institutional racism is? Because my problem with the concept is that if it is, in fact, still here, it would have to apply to everybody. But it doesn't, because there are successful people of all colors, and there are unsuccessful people of all colors. It would have to be something that would be broad stroked across every person of a particular marginalized race, if you will. So what is what is your theory on that? Just as an Sure. Opinion. So you're right in that that's a more difficult kind of truth to evaluate. Uh, it's easier to evaluate things like is there specific racism. Um, you look at the individuals who've been shot and, and killed uh, and uh, targeted apparently because of the color of their, their skin. Um, it's easier to make a case for that. You know, that, that happens. Right. It's easier to take a look at statistics of young black men who've been shot as a percentage, young white men who've been shot as a percentage. That's easier. That's very specific. Systemic racism, which is what you're talking about, is harder to prove. And I don't think that in pro-truth we would need to make the case for that. We're really going about the 90% of easy shots. But I will tell you a story on systemic racism that a good friend of mine shared with me. Uh, he um, was a uh, football scholarship winner in his college, college years back in the 70s and um, got four years free ride in University of Florida because he was on the football team. He was with second string. And he said in his last year playing was the first year that they integrated the team and allowed black players to play. And he actually was the only person on the team who volunteered to share his, uh, his, his, uh, his dorm room with that black player. But he only recently realized, you know, I wasn't really that good. If integration had happened a few years earlier, 
I wouldn't have gotten that scholarship. It would have gone to a black kid who was better than me. So I actually got my college tuition paid for because of systemic racism, which was keeping there being uh, equal opportunities for young black players to get on the football team. So he realized years later that that free education helped him through his entire career. I thought that this was, you, you know, uh, a, you, really something for somebody to look back and see, wow, my life was changed for something I didn't even see existed beforehand. So I think if we start thinking about systemic racism in terms of where we may have benefited without even realizing it, because there were not equal opportunities for those of different um, ethnicities, we can see where perhaps changing that would be better for all of us. Well, I agree with you. The other thing, let's go back to traveling outside of, of the United States. Racism is something that affects all people. The problem is in the United States, it's only viewed as white people versus everyone else. And yeah. white people are affected by racism in countries where they are a minority, okay? And and then in, in other countries, racism isn't really an issue. Like in China, uh, the persecution is of their own people, and of the, the there's well, the Muslims could, in the. If I can jump jump in there, yeah. I spent some time in Tibet when I was in China, and believe me, the Chinese are racist against Tibetans. Well, okay, it's I was horrible. just. I, and the I same was thing gonna, is true with the Uyghurs. Was yeah. going to say that the the Muslim the Uyghurs, right? Okay, right. Yeah, which but are also not, the Tibetans, which are not. Ethnically Chinese people, right, okay. Correct. But it's, it's in this country, it's just being viewed one-sided. And I think that because it has been viewed one-sided for a while, that it allowed somebody like Donald Trump to become president because he sort of took the other side and pointed that out and rallied his followers loosely based on that. I'm not going to say that that's his entire agenda right. but he right. certainly used that as an excuse to gain his popularity and to become president of the united mm -hmm. states so you know people always <laughs> said that absolutely that trump divided the country i don't believe that trump was the result of the division not the cause of it yeah i i agree with what you said and when you think about it trump rode to power on a lie he was the the chief person beating beating the drum of the birther movement, right? That Obama was supposedly not born in the United States, right. long been debunked, and yet that lie gathered a movement around him of people who felt Obama was not legitimate. And so by feeding them that lie, he became their spokesperson, their leader, somebody that they were ready to follow. And he, he, he rode that lie all the way to the White House. That was not the only thing that got him there, um, but certainly that was a powerful boost. And I think that's how he learned, hey, if I tell people what they want to hear, they'll vote for me. They'll follow me. And I believe that Trump has done, as a president, what he's done as a real estate um, dealer, and that is tell people the lies they need to hear in order to feel um, confident in trusting him. And that damages not only the individual who ends up Supporting someone whose policies might not be in their best interest also damages our communities because um, when government uh, can lie, it becomes incompetent, it becomes corrupt, and damages our country because it easily slides into authoritarianism. And the wheels of government become used to support a person rather than to support the nation and the institutions. So I think that's the road we've been on for the last few years. So how do we get to a point where... I'm going to pick up on, on your number two point here on your sheet. It says, don't all politicians mm -hmm. lie? What's so special about today's post-truth post politicians? Yeah, so in the past you've had politicians who've lied, and what has typically happened then is the media will expose it, um, they'll, they'll be condemned by their colleagues, and they, you know, in, the, in some cases they'll shamefacedly retract it. In other cases, Richard Nixon, he resigned to avoid impeachment um, in Bill Clinton. He was, you know, uh, drilled and Im impeached. And even some of his closest supporters back, backed away from him after, after that. He was shamed for, um, for a lie. But today, 
it almost seems like we expect it and we don't care about it. And and indeed, I, I have to say with Trump, he lies so often that outrage doesn't last more than a day before you move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next. So one really hardly knows what's true or false. So the power of censure of a lie has gone. And, and indeed, many of his allies in Congress won't stand up and say, that's false, that's, that's a lie. Um, it's ultimately up to us citizens to take a stand, to say that's not acceptable, to push back. And part of that means we have to protect ourselves, which is what the book Pro Truth is all about. It's giving people the tools to recognize and deflect lies when they come their way, but also to unite. And that's what the Pro Truth Pledge is about. It's a way that we can start to hold politicians accountable for their lives, regardless of their party. Well, g going back to the uh, systemic racism issue, what is the difference between a lie and a difference of opinion in the sense of something, whether it exists or not? You could ask two people and they say, no, systemic racism no longer exists in the United States. And other people would say, oh, yes, indeed it does. So now you have two people well, who, and, who are disagreeing on a particular issue of whether something exists. You can't even start to have a conversation about it. Right. So to have a meaningful conversation, you would need a set of facts. You need, for example, um, uh, studies of uh, enrollments. You'd need job application statistics, equally qualified black Americans and um, uh, white Americans. Are there statistics that show one is discriminated against compared to the other? No, there, studies like that do, do in fact exist. Uh, so you need a set of facts to begin with. But then you also need common definitions, and I believe that a lot of people who say there is no systemic racism in this country aren't looking at what systemic racism means the same way those who say, yes, it is. Systemic racism doesn't mean you are all racist. We check to see if we're racist by looking inside and saying to ourselves, do I feel racist? Do I have friends who are African Americans? Have I done a good turn to people who are African American? If they answer yes to those questions, they say, I'm not a racist. How about my friends? So that can get you to the feeling of racism. But systemic racism is something entirely different. So often people who are disagreeing are disagreeing about different things. They don't really know what each other is saying. In fact, you know, I've got a friend with very different political views than mine. And, you know, on social media, we often disagree. But when we sit down and talk, we find out we disagree far less than we think. We've just misunderstood what each other are saying. So certainly one of the ways to get back to more of a sense of unity is not to simply post our disagreements on social media, but to sit down and talk, to figure out what is each other really saying, and that means listening, and that means inquiring together about what the other person means and what are the facts they, they base their views on. We're not doing that anymore. We're just you know, thinking the other side hates the country, and man, that's, that's hurtful. Where's the starting point? I mean, the country obviously is divided. I think both sides can agree with that. So where do we start? Yeah. Where's the common there's ground? Two starting points. One that's personal and one that's in terms of reaching out to your, to your networks. The personal one, um, the book Pro Truth is meant for, and that is to listen closely to politicians when they speak, detect lies and protect yourself from them. And this is easy to do with politicians on the other side of the spectrum. But it's more valuable to do it with politicians who you naturally feel an affinity for. They're the ones you have to hold to account because they're the ones who will suffer if you say, you know what, I'm going to speak out against this person. I'm not going to support that lie unless they retract it. So hold your own side's politicians to account, I'd say would be number one. And use Pro Truth the book to give you the tools to do that. Number two is reach out to people with different political views than yours and don't reach out to change their mind. Reach out to have a conversation, to really hear each other clearly because people's politics are often based on their deeply held values. And most people's values are good values. They're just maybe different priorities. People value family. They value security. They value the safety of their, their, their children and their communities. They value freedom. They value equality. They value um, fairness. None of these things are wrong. We just have different priorities. But only if we really talk to each other can we get to the common values, not the false facts that are often put out by politicians that divide us so badly. 
So that would be my simple two-step prescription <laughs> for helping us get back to truth. Do you think the media is equally to blame? Uh, not equally. And, and I have to say, Douglas, as a former journalist myself, I really feel for journalists. You know, in the old days, before the Internet, the media had a really solid financial base. But the, um, the Internet, for all the good things it's given us, has made it very difficult for news organizations to stay afloat. And so they've cut a lot of their fact-checking budgets uh, and investigative journalism. They've gone to more opinion pieces um, or he said, she said, r reporting news of the day in the 24-hour news cycle. So their challenge is much different, and they're too easily tempted to just report the latest tweet, to just report on outrage and crisis and not do the digging for the truth that is the hallmark of good journalism. In a nutshell, you're suggesting that all the quote-unquote fake news is simply a direct result of economic downturn? No, I'm not. I'm saying that even in the best news organizations, they struggle to report the truth. Fake news is something the Internet has also created. You don't need a legitimate news organization. You can set up a website and start churning out stories that are deliberately designed to make people click on it and to spread conspiracy theories. There are, you know, there are fake news factories that churn this stuff out in Russia, in Eastern Europe, sure, here in the United States as well. Sure. But the purpose is to get you to click. And the problem is people tend to click on stuff that looks alarming and biased and divisive. So it's that's when they say clickbait, what it means here is uh, we follow our worst instincts and then get multiplied in the echo chambers. So we think, you know, all these conspiracy theories are true because they keep popping up online. It's a deadly deadly thing. And there's a beautiful documentary that just came out on this called The Social Dilemma. And I highly recommend your viewers, uh, your, your listeners, um, take a look at that because it really tells you how badly divisiveness is amplified by social media. Well, I have this conversation with, primarily with artists is what we uh, have on this show. And I've had this conversation over and over with musicians particularly about the double-edged mm -hmm. sword aspect of the internet and so obviously yeah. it's affected journalism tremendously as well as it's affected musicians and uh, and everybody really i mean it's a whole different yeah. world the only people that don't seem to be affected by it are the people that simply don't go on the internet <laughs> <laughs> you know i, I know a right. couple of people that are in their 80s that just don't have computers at all they never got into it and they still watch yeah. the nightly news at six o'clock, you know, and um, that's it. So, you know, they're not affected, yeah. but everyone else is. That's true. But, you know, I have to say, um, it's not surprising. We are all babies on the Internet. I, I mean, when, when literacy came about, when the printed press started, you know, lots of lies were printed and people would read them and would believe it was true. And you had massive disinformation being printed. Um, but we got more sophisticated about reading newspapers and being able to discern truth from, from falsehood. Not, not anywhere close to 100%. But so the Internet is brand new. We see stuff on the Internet and we're more inclined to believe it because it's been sent to us from a friend or a, or, or, or a colleague that we trust. So it gets past our suspicious filters. We just have to learn to get smart. We have to remember, we're all babies. The only problem is if you're a baby and you think you know everything. And the Internet does incline us to think we know everything. But if we recognize it's a dangerous world out there online, we need to have better filters to weed out misinformation and use the pro-truth pledge. It's a great way to protect yourself. Just like, you know, wearing a mask can protect you from getting the coronavirus. Taking the pro-truth pledge can help prevent you from getting the virus of misinformation and spreading it to others. So well, since that's you know, there's stuff we can do. Okay, since you brought that up with the masks, I, I'm still on the fence about the mask. I think that the mask can help somebody who has the virus prevent from spreading it to other people. But I'm not convinced that somebody who doesn't have it and wears a mask is protecting themselves from somebody else who may have it. I think um, a lot of studies are still in place on that. The latest thing that I read was it reduces the spread about 30%, right? So you're not safe unless you've got one of those, 
the I-95, uh, one of those 95, uh, N95 masks. If you're not safe, you still need to social distance, but you're less vulnerable and you're spreading less. Uh, it's just, you, you know, like if they held a handkerchief up in front of your face when you coughed, you wouldn't be spreading your germs. It's just as, as simple as that. So, no, it's not enough by itself, but it is significantly better than, than nothing. Well, okay. uh, To your larger point, though, I think wearing a mask for the sake of other people helps us realize this is a community effort. None of us can protect ourselves alone. We have to work to protect each other. Oh, uh, well, you just brought up another thing because I'll tell you what, having spent time in Asia, there's a much bigger bond of people willing to walk in a certain way. In America, that sort mm -hmm. of goes against the grain of our country. We don't walk in a particular way. We walk whichever way we feel like because it's our right <laughs> as free people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and um, where I think there's um, there's a road ahead for America is to realize that the flip side of freedom is responsibility. Ah, that yeah. to be free to live as you please also means being f that you have to protect the rights of others to also be free to live as they please, and that does mean there's some things you're not going to do. Hey, if you're sitting in the middle seat on an airplane back in the day. You don't take both armrests and just <laughs> make yourself as big as possible. Uh, you're free to do it, but you're a jerk. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay, last question. Then we got to wrap it up since we're on this topic. It's yeah. interesting. So what in the hell is the common thread that is going to weave a good social fabric for the United States? Mm. We got to start with one. Wow. Because I don't even see one at this yeah. point. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about um, that a lot. And, you know, Americans, you know, there's this love of the Constitution, of the documents that were embedded in the DNA of this country, right? Yeah. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The belief that all men, let's read that as all people, are created equal. You know, those words themselves, they've not only guided America, but that's what the world aspires to. The world wants those things that America claims for itself. And, you know, just coming back to those, where are we really able to grant ourselves life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness equally for all? Uh, you know, there's, there's our calling still. Um, and that's also what makes others look to the United States as, um, as a nation to aspire to. I fear that we've been losing that over the last four years. Us versus them, um, that's just the opposite of what those founding, founding documents um, called us all to. So that's where we could come, come back to it, I think. Well, you okay. Um, and pursuing life maybe nowadays means taking care of the lives of others in the midst of the pandemic. I hate to think, I've had this conversation about the pandemic on other interviews. I hate to think that the United States is suddenly going to unite as one and we're all going to be holding hands singing Kumbaya over a damn virus. Because I wish mm. there was something a little bit more positive. Maybe it's going to take a virus to do it. Yeah. Uh, the bad comes the good. But it just seems yeah. like we got to be able to do better than that. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, like you, know, you said about um, the masks, so, you know, I, yeah. I would hate to think that oh, so, I'm suddenly in, in community spirit with my with my neighbor because we both wear masks. I just wish it was yeah. something better than that. Uh, I tell you, I think there is something better. And um, a friend of mine has just written a, a, a book called Power Switch, which is uh, about how we can end a reverse extreme inequality. And one of the things that he says, and I'd be more than happy to introduce him to, uh, to you and your listeners. One of the things that he says is um, China is rising and it's almost inevitable that it's going to continue to rise. Sure. If the U.S. goes head-to-head -head with China, that could lead to a war. It could certainly lead to um, you know, impoverishment all around. But the U.S. could become a leader of a new global movement to end extreme inequality, making changes in its own law, but also making changes in the international order. And it would find allies in Europe, 
in Canada, in Japan, who would also be ready to create a counterpoint against China that sees that becoming the most powerful and dominating others is not the way forward. Believe me, make no mistake, that's where we're headed if China continues to rise. So the U.S., rather than being the world's only superpower, the world's policeman, could instead become a team player with the goal of reducing in extreme inequality worldwide, creating a better world for all, lessening our footprint on the environment, and really creating a future that humanity could thrive in. We're not on that path now, but it's possible. There's something much more to aspire to. So in other words, let's unite the United States, Europe, Canada, Mexico, South America, Africa, and the Middle East, and Russia all against China? Well, um, whoever wants to be part of a world that has the goal of sharing power and sharing wealth, as opposed to accumulating power and wealth, which is the Chinese goal, yeah, let them join. Okay, well, that's an interesting idea. Maybe we'll have you back and we'll talk about that one on the next show. We do have to wrap it up. Uh, my guest is Tim Ward, and the new book is called, what again? Pro-Truth, a practical plan for putting truth back into politics, and it's connected to the Pro-Truth Pledge at protruthpledge.org. Protect yourself, protect your community, and protect your country by valuing truth. Super. Thanks so much for coming on, Tim. This was uh, an interesting conversation. Best of luck with the book. My and, and, pleasure, Douglas. Uh, we do run your Thank ad. You. We run the pro-truth ad. We've been running it for the last couple of years because I definitely believe in, uh, in that concept of pro-truth. Thank you, Douglas. And thank you for signing the pledge and taking a stand for truth. Oh, my.